In the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a number of good reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. To begin, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to this channel and tell us what you thought of this video. Firstly, we shall consider references to Jesus external to the Bible, and then we'll turn to the Bible itself. It's no surprise that there are very few early non-biblical texts that even mention Jesus, since the name of Christ and his followers was not worthy of mention by most people at the time. However, his name does appear in a number of texts in the first and second century AD. It has to be remembered that these are not supportive of Christ or his followers. Here are two examples. The Roman historian Tacitus, writing in about 112 AD, refers to Nero's time. Nero punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men loath for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians. Christus, from whom they got their name, had been executed by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate when Tiberius was emperor. That's the first one. Tacitus was no supporter of Christ, but at least what he says does accord with known history of the Christians. Another person writing at this time was the Jewish historian Josephus. He was a Jew under the protection of the Romans and was therefore hated by many of his own nation. He covers the history of Israel in New Testament times, much of which is recognisable from the Bible text. In particular, he records the execution of James, the brother of Christ, and also refers to Jesus himself. His reference to the death of Christ is as follows. And when Pilate had condemned him to the cross on his impeachment by the chief men among us, those who loved him did not cease, for he appeared to them, as they said, on the third day, alive again. While it appears that Josephus probably did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, which is not at all surprising, he at least covers the essential part of the account in the Gospels. Now let's look at the Gospels themselves. We know that Jesus was a popular preacher who went about Galilee, Samaria and Jerusalem, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. He claimed to be the son of God and was recognised as such by his followers. In fact, these faithful men and women fully expected Jesus to overthrow the Romans and set up the kingdom of God there and then. In this belief, they accompanied him on his journey to Jerusalem and were amongst those in the crowd who shouted, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We read that in Luke chapter 19. Fully expecting the kingdom of God to be established immediately, they were so excited at the prospect that they missed important words of Jesus spoken to them on more than one occasion. For example, sometime early he had said, this is in Matthew 16, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This teaching of Jesus didn't register with the disciples because they were so convinced that Jesus would be king immediately. So when Jesus came to Jerusalem at Passover time and was betrayed to the chief priests, they were totally unprepared. It is very clear that they were shattered by the events which led to his death. This was something they had not expected. Seeing their beloved Lord being taken and nailed to the cross was an entirely harrowing experience. And as they left the scene, they were absolutely convinced that he was dead and that their hopes and beliefs were at an end. Some of the faithful women, followers of Jesus, made a note of where he'd been buried as a large stone was rolled over the tomb entrance. It was their intention to return after the Sabbath to anoint his body, a last loving act of devotion to the one they had loved. The record in Matthew tells us that the chief priests had gained permission for the tomb to be guarded by soldiers to prevent the body of Jesus being removed. In Matthew 27 we read, next day, that is the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, Remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. 
therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. They anticipated an attempt by the disciples to claim he was alive. So even if the disciples had been in a fit state to remove the body of Jesus, the armed guard would have prevented them. So the scene was set for the body of Jesus to remain in the tomb under guard at least until the end of the Passover celebrations. But when the time came, the women bearing spices assembled at the tomb in the early morning with the intention of anointing Jesus' body for burial. They were amazed to find the armed guards who had been detailed to guard the tomb had all disappeared. The stone was rolled back and the tomb was empty. It is clear that none of them knew what was happening. However, some of them saw an angel who told them in Matthew 28, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, come and see the place where he lay. These women returned and alerted the disciples. This caused Peter and John to run to the tomb to see for themselves. They too found it empty. It is clear from the text that this was all totally unexpected and they had no idea what was happening except that John, when he saw it, believed that Jesus was risen. We read that in John chapter 20. Jesus then appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden near the tomb, and she went to tell the disciples she had seen the Lord. The Gospels give us a few more occasions when Jesus was seen and spoke to the disciples, who are now witnesses of his resurrection. In fact, we learn in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus appeared to them over the course of 40 days before he ascended into heaven, explaining why he had to die and be raised again from the dead. So if this was all fabrication, why didn't the chief priest produce the body and prove to the world that Jesus was dead? When the soldiers of the watch came to the chief priests and told them what had happened, you would have thought that the priests would insist that these people were punished for not doing their job properly. But in Matthew 28, we read, and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. The chief priest clearly wanted to hush up the whole affair and pretend that nothing extraordinary had happened. This behaviour of the chief priests is probably the biggest issue that has to be explained if the resurrection of Christ is to be disc discounted. I'd just like to ask at this point, is this making sense? Please tell us in the comments. Let's carry on. There are plenty of other issues that need to be explained if we are to reject the Bible account of the resurrection. Firstly, it's entirely understandable that a guard was set over the tomb. But what made them run off? These were hardened soldiers. It couldn't have been the disciples. They'd seen their Lord die on the cross and were in no fit state to send the soldiers away in terror. The women and the disciples are all convinced that Jesus was dead and in the tomb. They, of all people, were not going to suddenly say he was alive unless they had absolute proof. It is clear that these people had been in the depths of despair. What else could change their wretchedness into such rejoicing unless they had really seen their Lord? The third point relates to Thomas, one of the disciples. He was absent when Jesus first appeared to the others. He refused to believe unless Jesus appeared to him. 
and he could see the wounds and touch them. Eight days later, Jesus did just that, and Thomas was at last convinced. It is important at this point to reflect what the Bible says. Jesus rose again in bodily form. This was no spirit floating around, but a resurrected man who had been released from the power of the grave. The fourth point, it is notable in the New Testament, just how many people saw the resurrected Jesus. We're told in the first of Corinthians chapter 15 that it was still possible 25 or 30 years later to ask people about their meeting with Jesus. In particular, before Jesus ascended to heaven, 500 people saw him at one time. So he didn't appear in secret, but was on full public display after his resurrection from the dead. Finally, Saul is an interesting example of a witness to the resurrection. He was violently opposed to the idea that Jesus was the son of God and that he had risen from the dead after his execution. Saul was a chief agent of the priests sent to bind people who were followers of Christ in Damascus and to bring them to Jerusalem for punishment. Nothing would convince him otherwise, or so he thought. As he approached Damascus, he suddenly saw a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. From that time, Saul, or Paul as he became known later, was one of the chief witnesses to the resurrected Christ and became a leading preacher of the gospel. What else could convince a man as ardently opposed to Christ to become one of his greatest supporters if it were not for the fact that he had actually met the risen Lord? So convinced were these people that Jesus had risen from the dead that they were prepared to die for him. They knew that the resurrection of Christ was a guarantee to those who confess him in this life, have a wonderful hope of resurrection when Christ returns. They no longer fear death. These things are well presented in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then those who belong to Christ at his coming. Well, there are of course other evidences from the scripture that we could turn to. But there's one I'd like to go to before we finish. And that is, that the resurrection of Christ was prophesied beforehand in the Old Testament, in the Psalms. We read in the Gospels, Jesus uttered the words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some read this as the final words of despair from a dying man. But when we read the Old Testament, we come across the same words in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me and from the words of my groaning? When we read through this psalm, we realise it is predicting the terrible suffering of this righteous man. For example, in verse 7, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. These remarkable words unmistakably reflect the situation of Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. The remarkable thing is that when 
Jesus' enemies carried this out, they were fulfilling the words of this psalm. But the psalm doesn't just reflect the suffering of Christ. It continues by describing the resurrection and future glory of Christ. In verse 22, I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Read the psalm right through and reflect that it is a remarkable prophecy of the sufferings of Christ and his resurrection. Jesus was indeed able to look back on his suffering and he would declare it to his brothers, all those people who have believed in the saving work of Jesus Christ. Of necessity, this has been a short survey of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You might still find it too much to believe, but the lack of concrete evidence to show the authorities were right and that the disciples were telling lies must surely point to the conclusion that Jesus did rise from the dead. And this great fact can be the basis for our faith in him. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, we too can have the hope of resurrection if we follow him and look to the day when he shall return to this earth. Once again, I would encourage you to subscribe to this channel and tell us what you thought of this video. You can also let us know what other subjects you'd like to hear about. Thank you. Mm -hmm.